just a little time on something else, and it's probably good for mathematicians to now and to think now and again about their distinguished predecessors in the context of their time. So and then I the last lecture at least, which will be next week, will be about mathematics again. So let me just continue. We were just finishing up with, with Galois' uh, discussion of on method, or with, with his preface. I don't know. I think he, one of them is called On Method. I think. So, and he was just turning uh, to, after attacking members of the academy and so on, he was turning to a brief discussion of the purposes of his, uh, I mean, the, uh, you know, the nature of his general ideas. And I think we'd said something of, but here there is nothing of the sort. Here the analysis is analyzed. He was emphasizing the abstract nature of what he'd done. Here the most advanced calculations carried out until present are considered as particular cases. So we'll come back to that. And then he goes on to say that the general thesis that I am proposing will not be understood without reading this work, which is an application of it. Attentive, attentively, so without, reading, without reading this work attentively. Not that the theoretical point of view preceded the application, but I asked, my book finished, what made it appear so strange to most readers? And looking inside myself, I thought I observed just such a tendency of my spirit to avoid calculations in the subjects treated. And what is more, I recognized an insurmountable difficulty that would be met by anyone wishing to carry them out generally with the matter treated. Now, I want us to remember that Gell was 21, and this is a very sophisticated, I think, philosophical analysis of Galois theory by someone who's 21. I want just and then he goes on, it was more in the vein of uh, his uh, first remarks. It should be foreseen that when treating such new domains, when risking oneself in such new paths, I have met difficulties that I could not overcome. Thus, in these two memoirs, and in particular in the second, which is more recent, the phrase, I do not know, appears frequently. The class of reader that I mentioned at the beginning will certainly find this an occasion for laughter. I suppose that was some, those were some of his examiners at the Ecole Polytechnique. It is unfortunate that they will not suspect that the book, the book the most valuable and the most learned is the one in which the author says everything that he does not know, that they do not suspect that an author never does more damage to his readers than when he hides a difficulty. When the reign of com competitivity, com competitiveness, excuse me, thus a vanity in the science ends, when one cooperates for studying rather than sending sealed packets to academies, one will be eager to publish the simplest observations, provided they are new. One will add, I don't know the rest. Well, I guess the day has come, perhaps, when one publishes the simplest observations, but I don't know that it's a good idea. And and, and recall that he was writing that in prison, so it was un presumably under disagreeable uh, circumstances. So then he goes, this preliminary discourse that follows is, is more, uh, once again, more philosophical, more, more epistemologically analyzed, one analyzes once again, after some preliminary remarks, what he was doing. So the following memoir was sent about seven months ago to the Academy of Sciences in Paris and misplaced by the commissioners who were to examine it. The work has therefore acquired no prestige. It would encourage reading it. And this is not the only reason that has kept the author from publishing it. If he finally decided to do so, it is for fear that more deft mathematicians taking over the same field may cause him to lose entirely the fruits of a long labor. Well, those are petty thoughts for Galois. I don't think he needed to think that way. The aim has, that has been proposed is to characterize equations that can be solved by radicals. So for the non-mathematicians in the audience, I point out that this is, so to speak, the most obvious application of what Galois does. One asks oneself the question, can I, if I'm given an equation, if you have given an equation of second degree, ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0, then you know you have a formula for solving it, solution. Uh, minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. So in there is this radical, the square root of b squared minus 4ac. And we saw uh, 
similar example for an equation of the third degree in which there was a cubed power of third power of x. There are examples of the fourth, I mean, for fourth degree one can do something similar. But after that, and that was discovered just a few years before Galois, uh, it's generally impossible to solve an equation in radicals. And what he proposed was a theoretical analysis of this situation. And it's the most obvious application of Galois theory. So the aim that has been proposed is to characterize equations that can be solved by radicals. We can affirm that no domain more obscure and isolated from the rest exists in pure analysis. The novelty of the material has required the usage of new terminology and new characteristics. We have no doubt that this inconvenience will be, will, be buff, will be buff from the start. The reader who can scarcely pardon the use of a new language, even to authors for whom he has every respect. But finally, we have had no choice but to conform to the demands of the subject whose importance merits a certain attention. So given an, the question is, give, the question that he addresses is not the only question addressed by his theory, but the question he addresses in that particular memoir to which he's ref referring is, given an equation, algebraic, you'll notice that the translation went rather fast. There's sometimes an inversion of, of noun and adjective that's not appropriate. So given an equation, an ar algebraic equation with arbitrary coefficients, which are numerical or literal, literal means that they're just general, they're expressed by letters. So just indeterminate, if you like. Determine whether the roots can be expressed by radicals. Now, you could also ask whether they could be expressed by a particular kind of radical. You remember when we discussed the equation, the uh, construction of the regular heptadecagon, so the regular polygon with 17 sides, we discovered that the roots could be constructed by repeatedly taking square roots. Hmm? We took square roots four times. So you could ask for more precise information and what kind of radical. Maybe you want to see if you can solve, solve it by extracting only square roots and cube roots, something. So if now you give me an equation that you have, that you have constructed any way you like, and you want to know whether it is solvable or radical. So he's written a, a paper. Think of him. He's written a paper. He claims he's going to tell you when an equation can be solved in this way. And if you want to know whether it, or not it is solvable by radicals, I have nothing to do but to indicate the way to reply to the question, but without obliging either myself or anyone else to do so. In a word, the calculations are impracticable. So, so what he has to do immediately is admit that, in fact, the methods he proposed are, in any given case, useless. Um, accordingly, it appears that there are no fruits to harvest from the solution that we propose. Now he goes on. Indeed, it would be so if the question presented itself ordinarily from this point of view. But most times, in applications of algebraic analysis, one is led to equations whose properties one knows in advance, properties by means of which it will always be easy to, re to reply to the question by the rules we propose. So this is epistemologically, I mean not epistemologically, but somehow philosophically very sophisticated. Um, there exists, in effect, for these kinds of questions, a certain order of metaphysical considerations that float over all the calculations and often render them unnecessary. I cite, for example, the equations that give the division of elliptic curves and that the celebrated Abel solved. You remember when we just briefly referred to Gauss's diary, we discussed the division of the lemniscate, which is in some sense analogous to the division of the circle. The lemniscate was a, was a, was a figure H shaped uh, curve. And Gauss had already proposed to himself the question of dividing that curve up into, say, five or 17 equal parts. And we showed, I, I, I don't have them here today, but you, and you may recall that we gave, and I presented on uh, transparencies, some of the equations that Gauss had derived for this. And those equations were terribly complicated. And I, uh, you recall there were equations of, of order 20, uh, 
for a division into five equal parts. It was the equation of degree 24. And the ordinary mortal could not tell anything about the solutions of that equation simply by looking at it. And what Galois is pointing out is that nonetheless, it's the, 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 the way that equation arises means that it's going to be solvable by radicals on the basis of his theory. And that is what Abel had, in fact, discovered. Right? So, so what he's saying, and th this is the significance of Galois theory, is that if a problem arises in a certain way, theoretically, then his methods will deal with it. But they will not deal with it if you just give an equation with numbers. And then he won't know what to do. It is certainly not because of the numerical form that this mathematician succeeded. That's true. That's true. What makes the theory beautiful and at the same time difficult is that unceasingly one indicates the progress of the calculations and foresees their result without ever able, being able to affect them. I cite as well the modular equations. And you notice that this particular preface ends with a comma. And all, if you look at Galois' writings, you will see that uh, People have taken pages and turned them into print, but uh, many things are crossed out. There are additions. There are, everything is incomplete, and so on. He was writing them toward much of it towards the last days of his life, and uh, or in a hurry or under strange circumstances. So that's that's the end of Galois, and I and I don't think we'll come back to Galois. It would be very interesting, of course, to analyze. And if you think about it, it's not so easy exactly why. This theory, this theory, which, as I said, is basically complete in Galois' papers, comes to play such a central role in much of pure mathematics. There are, there are good reasons for it, uh, some of which uh, are already expressed by Galois, but I think they're not all expressed by Galois. I mean, there are more sophisticated reasons than those Galois advocates. Uh, you can test your friends about that. I just ask them uh, why they think Galois theory is important for mathematics and see what answer you get uh, as your mathematical friends. Now, as I hit, now I want to come to Coomer. Coomer is not such an exciting figure. I pointed out to you that Coomer lived to be, they were both Coomer and Galois were born within a year of one another, or within at least one was born in 1810, one was born in 1811. And Kumar lived about six, uh, 70 years longer than Galois. He died in, I think, eight, he died in 1893. Um, but, and, but he, so what I would like to do in the case of Kumar is, he, he has some philosophical remarks too about what he does, but they come much later. I, uh, he, he was also, had political involvement. It was much more modest, a little more dull than that of, uh, of Galois. But nonetheless, for mathematicians who don't know too much about Coomer and who probably don't know too much about European history, uh, it's, I think, worthwhile just to recall what it was. And it's fun. Coomer is a, is a sympathetic person. Uh, and uh, he reflects very well at the 80 years of his life. I mean, he is the course of his, uh, not of his mathematical development, but the, the development of his general ideas about the world seems to follow very closely the development, for better or for worse, of his times. So let me just remind you of the background. So I took it from a standard history of, the, of Germany in, in that period between 1770 and 1866. And so, so that we can fit Coomer in and see why he's doing what he does, let me recall that. So, we can begin then with the revolution of 1848, which, as you recall, I recall, began in France and led to the downfall of Louis the Philippe. So Galois didn't live long enough. That we recall that Galois was not too sympathetic and not too fond of Louis Philippe, and he did live long enough to see him fall from power. Of course, he didn't uh, live long enough to see the younger Napoleon rise to power either, which would wouldn't exactly have <laughs> pleased him, but. In any case, the revolution in France in 1848 led to the fall of Louis the Philippe. So let me just cite a few lines from this, from this history, some selected lines. 
uh, by Sheehan, German history. So on the 22nd of February, the streets of Paris were filled with anti-government demonstrators. The next day, they built barricades and fought with royal troops. On the day after that, King Louis, the Philippe, King Louis Philippe fled. And the revolution spread, and in particular, it spread to Germany, which was, our, which was where Kummer was. Beginning in the southwest at the end of February, a wave of unrest spread through the German states, states until it reached the Russian frontier. In hundreds of cities, towns, and villages, people demanded political reform, social justice, and relief from misery and servitude. With the possible exception of the months immediately after the First World War, there is no other period in German history so full of spontaneous social action and dramatic political possibilities. So March the 13th, we were outside of Germany for a minute, minute. Metternich, the Austrian chancellor, resigns after protests, demonstrations, and violence in Vienna. And Metternich wrote a brief letter relinquishing all his posts 24 hours later in disguise and with money borrowed from the Rothschilds, he left the city to begin a long and circuitous passage to England where he joined other casualties of the revolution such as Louis-Philippe himself, Guizot, Prince William of Prussia, and Lola Montez, who was, as you recall, associated to the King of Bavaria. So it wasn't a good time for her. So in Austria, moderate opinion was delighted by the emperor's proclamation of the 15th of March, which abolished censorship and promised to convene a constitutional assembly. But in order to enjoy these newly won achievements, it would be necessary to have peace and domestic tranquility. So we're somehow I mean, trying to see the framework in which Kummer's views, Kummer's views will come to be expressed, were formed. It would be necessary to have peace and domestic tranquility. The violence which the moderates had used for their own end on the 13th of March had to stop. Count Hoyas, the new commander of the Civil Guard, called upon responsible people to join his, fights, his fight against the wild criminal impulses of the proletariat. So we'll, we'll see what Kummer has to say about that. Uh, so we see, as I said, we see a conflict where there are no quotation marks here. There are, it's it's just, trans, trans, just transitional remarks of mine. So this is the conflict between liberal and proletarian elements that will be reflected in in Kummer just a little. So, so in Prussia in particular, we just talked about Austria and in Prussia in particular in Berlin, the similar forces were at work. And on the 17th of March, because Prussia where, is where Kummer was, of course, Frederick William approved plans that met some of the moderate's most important demands. On the morning of the 18th, however, the king appointed General von Pritwitz a hardliner as military commander of Berlin, Pritwitz's troops, apparently frightened by the presence of a large and peaceful gathering in front of the royal palace, fired into the crowd, killing several civilians. People reacted furiously. So she re remarked that we do not know the social position of those who fought against the king's soldiers, but we do know the identities of men who died, many who died in the fighting. Most of them were males between the ages of 20 and 35. They included a few members of the Burgertum, and some manual workers, but the overwhelming majority consisted of craftsmen. And Kummer, of course, was not a craftsman. The bloody events of 18th March made a shambles out of Frederick Wilhelm's, William's attempt to channel the opposition into a moderate course. That evening, he faced in stark and unyielding terms what he had been trying to avoid for a fortnight, the choice between determined resistance or unambiguous surrender to popular demands. Early in the morning of 19th March, he wrote his famous proclamation and Meine Lieben Berliner, which accepted the insurgent's key demand. Theodor Fontana, who had spent the evening crouched on a barricade in Alexanderplatz, which is still there in Berlin, looks a little different, I guess, now than it uh, did then, recalled the feelings of joy and exultation with which he and his comrades learned of the king's decision. Victory was theirs, but the revolution's triumph had been given them as a gift just as easily be taken back. So this was, as recall, most of you will know that the March 18th revolution was an ambiguous, uh, uh, ultimately, I suppose, unfortunate uh, victory in for uh, more Republican-oriented people in Germany, or partial victory. So Fontana describes his experiences on March the 18th in his autobiography. Now, Fontana, it's not a favorite of everyone. Maybe most of you haven't heard of him, but Fontana is an author whom I like very much. And uh, he's a 19th century German novelist in particular. And uh, he's still a delight to read. And what I want to do, it happens to exist, namely, 
he, like Kumar, he at that time, as I said, was not, was not yet a, an author, or known author. He, was, uh, he began his life as, a, as an apprentice to a pharmacist, and he was still a pharmacist apprentice at the time, that he too became an elector. He, like Kumar, was an elector. I'm going to just say something about this in just a minute, what an elector was. And so, I mean, you have to indulge me even more than you had feared, perhaps. I'm going to re give you uh, Fontana's description of his experiences as, as an elector before I give you Kumar's experiences. It does, it's somehow curious to see them to side by side. So I remind you what these elections were like. So somewhat earlier, the Diet in Frankfurt, the seat of the Confederation of German States, uh, which had been formed after Napoleon, the Napoleonic conquest of Germany, had begun to respond to events. So on March the 10th, uh, I think we can skip some of this, basically what had been decided was that there would be, after the March 18th events, that there would be a response and it was decided in a rather strange manner, but there would be elections to a parliament in Frankfurt, which had at one time, of course, been the seat of the German Empire, and then it was the seat of this confederation. And there were to be elections, but these elections were not to be, were to be, were controlled as much as they could be. And in particular, there, it seems that they were controlled in various ways in various German states, but we can assume that uh, both that since, uh, Fontana was in Berlin, and uh, Kummer was in Breslau, which, thanks to Frederick the Great, had been part of Prussia for about 100 years. That basically, the same method applied, and it was a two-step ballot. So, the, the, what happened was that all those who were eligible to vote for, to vote at all, and that wasn't everyone. Some efforts were made to exclude the lower orders from uh, any uh, possibility of voting, uh, elected what were called, what was, what was called, if you like, a Wallman, so an elector. And then this elector, these, the electors, those who were chosen, then had the responsibility of electing the deputies to the Frankfurt Parliament. And both Fontana and Kummer were made Ballmen are uh, electors. So let me start then with Fontana's experience. Hmm? So Fontana is writing, this is an autobiography, and he's writing several decades later, and he's describing his experiences as a young man. And he says, I no longer know how many weeks later the elections to a constituting assembly began. A representation of the people was, call, was, to, was to call up, was to be called up and the Constitution was to be confirmed by it. As is well known, things turned out a lot differently, and the final result, after refusal to grant taxes and dissolution of the Assembly, was a conceded Constitution, and conceded by the, by the King of Prussia, and not one dictated by the will of the people. Anyhow, elections to the Constituting Assembly. The method of election corresponding to the th what he calls three-class system that exercises blessing up to that time, and what it came to was not direct elections, but indirect. In other words, that an intermediary pushed himself in. This intermediary was the Wahlmann, so the elector. And he was generated by the primary electors, who were called Urwähler. And then the, Wahl the group collection of Wahlmann, in turn, generated the deputy. All the details of the procedure have, of course, long vanished from my memory, and I still own know only that I myself was old enough to make an appearance as Urwähler. I acquired, therefore, I suppose, a necessary document, and equipped with it, betook myself to the premises in which the primary electors of the Neue Königstrasse and vicinity were to come to a conclusion about their Wahlmann and to grant him their political procuration. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I shouldn't. Excuse me. I forgot. that for the benefit of those who can look at it, I'm going to let you look at it. I'm going to let you look at the fragment from uh, Fontana's autobi autobiography. So there, there it is. Uh, you should, it should be down here someplace. Why are we here? Okay, somewhere here. Though. 
No, you can issue answer. Okay. Although I say premises, that is not quite correct. According to Berlin, to Berlin notions, premises are spots where there are many waiters lounging about who occasionally bring you a pint, even before it has been ordered. Our election premises were by no means of this sort. It's rather a large, long shed, on both of whose sides enormous sacks of, woods, of wool were piled high, while two of these sacks were shoved at right angles to each other and formed a compartment, a kind of business room. In front of them, a small table had been placed at which an electoral official or someone of the sort sat, a dignified elderly gentleman, apparently also the most intelligent, was to take charge of events. The number of those present was not large, at most some 30, and as nobody quite knew what was to be done, we all stood round in groups and waited for someone who had at least some notion of how to proceed, took matters in hand. Na naive folk always have great need for direction. The electoral official finally asked if one of those who had shown up wouldn't like to suggest a possible Wallmann. Everyone expressed agreement, but otherwise remained silent. And eyes were all turned to a lanky middle-aged gentleman who in, the excite in that excitement that is a certain sign of someone with a great urge to speak and an accompanying inability to do so paced back and forth in front of the two wool sacks. He was as much an image of misery as of comedy, accented by his dress. Whereas the rest of us, mostly small artisans, small shopkeepers or waiters, had turned up in our everyday clothes, the excited fellow wore a black frock coat and a white candidate's band. He constantly took off his glasses and put them on again and was annoyed when the stems were snagged in his wiry blonde hair. Who is the gentleman, I asked my neighbor. That's the principal of the school just across the way. What's his name then? Schaefer, I think, but it could also be Sheffer. I'll just ask Rizika. Hey there, Rizika. And it was apparent from my sake that for my sake he was about to cry out to his friend, the baker Rizika, about Schaefer or Sheffer. He didn't get to it, as in just that moment the principal placed himself beside the table of the elderly gentleman who was directing the proceedings and said, A couple of key words remain in my mind, more or less the following. Ja, meine Herren, what has brought us together. We are gathered together here in this wide space, and each of us is certainly imbued by it. And everyone is doubtful, doubtless grateful to God that we have a race of princes like ours. There is no land where such a race, and we stand with it in love and loyalty. But, my dear gentlemen, neither horse nor rider. You have to go to, to Fontana and the footnotes to see the references to some of these phrases. You know that in this place, too, there have been heroic struggles. The blood of citizens has been spilt, and victory has been on our side. We have now to chain this victory to our flag. For that, we need the right men who are aware at all times that the German spirit is incapable of baseness, and betrayal of our holiest possessions is baseness. I know that there is no one under us, but not everyone thinks and feels this way. There are still many who desire life before freedom. They tear at it with the beaks of vultures. Therefore, I'm for annexation to France, and I see a danger for Prussia from that man who put Poland in the coffin and who's opposed to a young freedom. Just as a matter of explanation, that man is Nicholas I. Thus, meine Herren, men of proven loyalty to the king, of proven loyalty to the people, Jan, Hans, Boyen, Grohlmann, perhaps also Full, they will hold our flag high. I vote for Humboldt. So, remember, Kummer also made a speech. We'll come to Kummer's description of his own speech. The speech was met with applause, and only the chairman smiled. But he did not feel the need to refute it, and so it fell to my wretched self to catch... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not keeping up here. So it fell to my wretched self to catch the reins of the principal as he raced off in a wild chase of the most elevated goals, much against my inclinations. I was righteous, righteously indignant over these desolate, pompous, gimcrack notions and observed accordingly that it was not given to us here below to concern ourselves directly with the Hohenzollerns or with freedom that we had no more to do here on God's earth than in our capacity as Urweiler to elect a modest Wallmann. Everything else came later. Then would come the time to steer Prussia to the left or to the right. I had therefore to decline on this occasion to give Alexander von Humboldt my vote and was rather in favor of my neighbor, the baker Rüsiker, of whom I knew that he was a generally respected man 
and had the best rolls in the whole neighborhood. <laughs> Since, as it happened, there was no other baker present, my proposal was generally approved, but Rusica himself, free of all ambition, wanted to hear nothing about being elected, proposed rather, in considerate revenge, my name, and as 10 minutes later we left the electoral premises, I was indeed Volman. So this was my debut in the wool staple, and at the same, my first and last appearance as a politician. So a few lines further on, he continues. On the evening of the same day, I went out to Britannia, and I think I've been to Britannia, in order to visit. I've been to Britannia, haven't I? In order, from a, so I went out to Britannia in order to visit Pastor Schultz. From a few words that had just been uttered as I entered, I made out with no difficulty that they were speaking of the elections and making fun of them. Schultz, otherwise a very serious man, too serious, was the hardiest of all, and as he saw me making my bows from the door to the gentleman present, he called to me in high spirits, What brings you here, now that you become an elector? I nodded. Of course, you look exactly like one. Everybody laughed, and I thought it wisest to join in. Even though my insides boiling, I was saying vainly to myself, Dear Schultz, I'll get even with you. So this is Fontana, how he, I mean, how he claims to have felt about being an elector. Actually, as you'll see, it, he rather enjoyed the experience. So he has a certain mocking tone, and it's one now to compare it with Coomer's tone, because Coomer communicated with his student and friend, the mathematician Kronecker, his own experiences. Uh, Kumar was not in Berlin, he was in Breslau, and, uh, which was, as I said, as I say, part of uh, Prussia. And his reactions are immediate. So this, lect this letter that, uh, to which I now come was written, uh, to presumably sh very shortly, a few days after being, after he was elected. So let's see what he has to say. And this is the Kumar, you remember this distinguished elderly gentleman with a thick mustache or something. Can you imagine, he's now 1848, he would be about 38, he would be relatively young. Can you imagine that in the last eight days I've twice tried my hand at speech making? First of all, before a meeting of our electoral district, where I spoke about the qualities of a good elector and was very well received and was unanimously elected chairman of the next meeting. During the first meeting, I had reconnoitered the terrain and discovered that the Democratic Club prevailed through the presence of insignificant individuals who were trying to push themselves forward as electors. In order to succeed, they flattered the workers through suspicion on civil servants and availed themselves of all the usual tricks. I decided thereupon to eliminate, in my own person at least, one of these fellows and delivered a second speech directed principally at the workers. Although I applied means exactly opposite to those of the Democrats, namely to point out to the workers exactly what they had achieved since the 18th of March and to imbue them with confidence in the present regime, I succeeded completely. The Democrats held indeed another meeting on Sunday where they attempted to eliminate me, but that didn't work as you saw from the list of electors. Besides me, of course, apart from two local citizens, only members of the Democratic lobby club were elected for Frankfurt and Berlin. In fact, the Democrats here won solidly. I myself am not prejudiced against the Democrats, provided that their views about the solid establishment of a thoroughly free constitutional monarchy are sincerely men, and they don't take to the field against royalty or attempt secretly to undermine it. I'm basically fonder of the Democrats than of the, than of the Philistine citizens, who hardly participate any longer in the elections for Frankfurt because they have little, if any, interest in them. The demands that I place on a deputy to Berlin are true love of the fatherland, insight and understanding, and strength of character. I place no special demands because, after all, we have to take the candidates that are left after the narrow and narrowest choices. I don't know quite what he means by that. We'll be lucky if we, in the end, can choose from two good candidates the best. It's certainly possible that, in the end, we'll have to choose the lesser of two evils. For a deputy to Frankfurt, the demands would be the same, but the love of the fatherland would have its roots more in a single Germany than in Prussia, and the insight extend more to the general. I am very proud of my title of elector, as you can see from the circumstance that in Furstenstein, where we were on Wednesday, 
I registered myself as E. Kummer Wallmann. My wife is Wallweib. <laughs> my cousin is Urweiler. And Louis, Louis Kauer, who I think was a sister-in-law, as Waldverwandtschaft. Yeah. Well, Verwandtschaft, of course, means elective affinity. So he's referring to one of two possible things, either Goethe or some chemical theory. You can decide probably to both. I'm really pleased with my success, in particular because my sincere patriotism allowed me to overcome my timidity and to stand up and speak before such a mixed assembly. As soon as I have done my duty as a citizen, namely immediately after the election for the Frankfurt Assembly, I shall return with all my forces to my mathematical work, as I'll have for the moment nothing more political to do. If you visit me next week, as I am hoping, then I'll recount more about the local elections and give you the draft of my first speech. The second was almost spontaneous and only vaguely planned. All the best and the best of greetings from all my family. So that's Kummer. Uh, if you could compare it, it's, um, it's interesting, and I think it's typical for Kummer and the rest of his. This was a, a letter, f uh, this is this letter, right? It's written from Kummer to Kronecker. So it's in his collected works. In order to see what Kummer met when he is Wallman elected the deputy, I continue with Fontana's account. So that's a further indulgence. Uh, but I just couldn't resist. So th th this is the next. These are the next few pages in in Fontana's autobiography. There is. Uh, some of you may have seen it. There's an American historian, Gordon Craig, who's, who's a historian of the 19th century. German history, and he's written a book about Fontana. And the remarkable thing is that Gordon Craig looks, he, uh, he, 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 he dresses and has a hairstyle exactly like the 19th century Fontana, so very, very long, what do they call it? Mutton chops. He has mutton chops and a curled mustache and so on. It's very, uh, it's very curious to see. He's actually a very good historian and very but uh, very, very well known, but he's taken Fontana in 19th century Berlin styles very much to heart. <coughs> so here's, here's Fontana again. He's describing now the second election, the election of the deputy. So I've spoken earlier of my status as a lector and the oratorical achievements in the Woolstaple in the Neue Königstrasse, leading to it as my first and last appearance as politician. I should add that this first and last appearance as politician had as one of its components a sequel. The sequel was the assembly of all manner for the purpose of the election of a deputy. I was elected in the Woolstaple in the Woolstaple in the Neue Königstrasse. I was to elect or at least to take part in the deliberations in the concert hall of the Royal Theater. That I did, and I count the hours in which the deliberations took place among my happiest. So the somewhat sarcastic tone has now been abandoned. Everything was full of life and interest, even though in respect of genuine politics, every modern politician would turn his face in disgust. Things were said precisely of the best men that had almost no relation to the subject to be treated there, but so bizarre, often even bordering on the comic. These shots in the treetops appeared, that, so the, the, these shops, shots in the treetops appeared bizarre and even comic. There was still something in the expectorations of these dilettantes. The old General Reiher, chief of the general staff and predecessor of Moltke, who often spoke gratefully of him as his teacher, spoke once and briefly offered a confession of faith, perfectly useless in connection with the matters that we were there to settle. It made, nevertheless, a great impression on me to hear a distinguished old general confess freely to his faith in his king and in the army, for one heard then very little of such things. And then on the same day, I believe, the old Jakob Grimm stepped up to the podium, the wonderful head fixing itself in the memory like the head of Mumson in a halo of long snow white hair. I actually have seen there's a, some obscure gallery, in, not so obscure, but in some back in some corner of a gallery in Berlin, there's a wonderful picture of Mumson, who was a very beautiful man. I wanted to get a copy of it, but we couldn't get them. So, and spoke something completely general about Germany that in any proper political gathering would have brought shouts of to the point down on his head. 
This shout was, however, not heard because everyone was moved by the sight and felt that no matter how far away all of that might lie, it was to be fallen, like it or not. There were two splendid figures that remained in my memory forever. Well, these were, those were two splendid figures that remained in my memory forever. Well, the others were, by and large, chatterboxes and nullities, a few even confidence men. Now, I think that Kummer would have felt very, I repeat that partly for the fun of it, partly because if you look at Kummer's letters and you look at Kummer's descriptions of various things, you, you can see that he would have enjoyed such a gathering. He, he was made. Uh, one of my colleagues, I, I didn't take him to task for, but one of my colleagues uh, suggested in a lecture he gave, a lecture he gave to the uh, Amius, or the Association of Members of the Institute for Advanced Study. I used the word nerds, but what he, what he was suggesting that uh, mathematicians were, mathema were socially very clumsy hmm? and inadept. And I think it's inappropriate, at least there are socially clumsy in mathematicians, but they're not all socially clumsy. And in particular, Kummer and probably his friends Dirichle and Jacobi were not socially clumsy. Uh, so, Kummer, and in contrast to Gelwast, Kummer was neither rebellious nor dissatisfied. He, he seems to have taken life as it came, fond of his country. He volunteered for the army. He spent a year in the Prussian army. He apparently he volunteered. You can see that he liked to hunt, and he was pretty gregarious. And he also seems to have been a rather an, an administrator, rather a trusted administrator. So he became rector. In spite of what he says, he be, that he wasn't going to withdraw completely from politics, he did become rector at Breslau, Breslau on, in, in October of 1848. Now, I want to try it. You know, Breslau is now, I'm pronounced, it's, no, I don't think I can be corrected by anyone here, but let me try. Wroclaw, okay? That's a, Breslau is easier than Wroclaw. But, um, so he was rector there. Now, one, Breslau, was, was, Breslau was, was a provincial city, and one can't imagine that it was a very big university. And of course, it was a university system in which, so far as I know, all professorships were negotiated directly with the Prussian Minister of Education, so that he would not have had much power and presumably not have too much to do. But he, he did have something to do, and pr presumably he did have something to do after the March Revolution, because he might. I would assume he had an uneasy course to steer between students who were somewhat activist and uh, a Prussian administration that uh, did not want, among other things, activist students. Now, the speech he gave on assuming the office of rector is extant. So it's a lecture which is entitled Academic Freedom and the Purpose of the University. So it's quite long. You should probably read it, but I think to understand the subtleties and nuances, one would probably have to be quite very familiar with the difficulties faced by a rector in a small Prussian university at that time. Uh, I'm, and it's not clear to me, uh, uh, glancing through it, what Kummer is defending as academic freedom and uh, what he's suggesting are the limits of academic freedom. So let me just content myself with quoting two passages, and that's basically going to be it. So. On the assumption, of course, it's a, <laughs> it's a very effulgent speech. Uh, I think I have it here. You could. Did I, did I? No, I didn't. I don't have it here. Okay. On the assumption of the rector of the university, now in a time in which our entire fatherland has made progress that is of the highest significance in its, histor in its historic development, and that has set in great motion all members and institutions of the state. And therefore, our university as well, I am seized by a certain uneasiness, for I do not know how far I shall succeed in fulfilling the high duties that this office imposes on me. The academic year that now lies ahead of us will acquire, no doubt, just as the year now ending, more than usual significance through the numerous improvements and new arrangements that it will call into being, which satisfy the needs of the present and the generally awakened freer spirit. The more important and the more pregnant with consequences this progress is, the heavier is the responsibility that I assume as rector. But the greater is the urge in me to devote myself, the entire force of my being, to the care of the prosperity and well-being of the university. 
indeed in the firm hope that the newly awakened political life in our fatherland, even with all the contending contradictions with which it is imbued, will further the well-being of our institution, my unease vanishes, and I am delighted that it is now granted to me to participate fervently in this progress. The German universities, as the highest institutions of learning in our fatherland, as the hearths of the spirit of our nation, have from the beginning not only incorporated this spirit, but also developed and propagated it through teaching and writing. They have thereby not alone moved ahead with the times, but insofar as the true progress of the spirit has been nursed at their bosom, they have even outpaced the times. To mention only one thing, one of the grandest blossoms of the present, the idea of German unity has been for more than 30 years cultivated almost solely by the universities at a time when it went almost unnoticed by the people and when the governments attempted to suppress and extirpate it with various measures and punishments. So there he's expressing, I guess, a certain dissatisfaction with the government. Another excerpt from the middle. I want, therefore, to limit myself here to mentioning one of the significant rights that were won for the entire German nation through the overthrow of the old administrative system. The right of association, which is of great importance for the universities too, specifically for the forms of academic freedom in the life of, the st of students. There is no doubt that this right is also available to the students and that the expected new academic laws in no way restrict it, but that rather only certain forms are to be respected by the student association they are going to be recognized as such by the university authorities. You guess, and your guess is as good as mine, what he's saying to the students. So he, he's, only, he's not very old. He's only about 38 when he's giving those two speeches. And, and then he went on. So I mean, I just remind you that during the in the course of time that there was a consolidation of Prussia's position at the expense of Austria. And one sees that reflected in his speeches. Franco-Prussian War, the creation of the German Empire, that was also reflected in his speeches. He gave quite a few, and for some reason or other, it was decided to print them in his collected works. He was secretary, he went to Berlin after Breslau, and he was secretary of the uh, Royal Academy of Sciences, and on various occasions, on the anniversaries of various, uh, of uh, Frederick the Great in particular, on the anniversary of the reigning king, who served, soon became Wilhelm I, he had to give speeches. He sometimes gave speeches on other occasions, and some of them were quite anodyne, some delightful. He describes, for example, the uh, contributions of Jacobi and Dirichlet to the uh, mathematical development in the country and in Berlin as such. And he has a taste for history. And so he, c he can go on at, at some length. And there's one. And he reflects, of course, that he reflects in these speeches, and that's rather fascinating, the changes of the time. He in, partic in particular reflects, as time goes on more and more, the militaristic spirit of, of Prussia. And he gives, I think, in, in 1877 or something, he has occasion to give a speech on the, uh, on the birthday of the Prussian king, the German Empire, Emperor Wilhelm. And it's actually a very I glanced through it again, haven't studied it. Uh, Kuma, like Dirichle, to, in order to earn supplement his salary, taught at the military college in Berlin. So he was quite, he had a lot of social intercourse with uh, the Prussian military. And what it is is a description of the military career and the military innovations in, introduced by the king. The military career started very early. Uh, started sometime at the, of, the, of the king. Then king started at the age of nine, sometime during the Napoleonic War. So it was a very long career. And, and uh, Kumar describes in some detail the, the course of the Prussian army during all that time. And it's, it's, it makes for instructive reading, as far as, I've, as far as I've read it. And on the whole, it seems to me that for those who have time and those who have the inclination, there's something to be said for reading those speeches of, of Kumar. There's something to be said for seeing the changes of that, of those times, changes that uh, are much long later, rather distressing in many respects, uh, as, as they were seen through the eyes of someone who is otherwise a fairly sympathetic figure. All right, so you've now indulged me, all that you need to indulge me, and now we have to go back to our old notes on on mathematics. So now we want to talk basically about Kummer and Fermat. 
just to give you some idea of what happened. Um, I will give you, if I can find them, notes for next week's lecture. So I have the final notes, which means that I don't have anything more to do in the way of writing notes. Uh, well, these are not for today. These are for next week. I have, I have to go. I'm assuming uh, I'll go around to the other side. I'm going to, let me just, I hope I have enough. One, two, three, four, how many? Five. We have, we have one pair there who are the only one. It looks as though I'm going to be out of, going to have trouble here. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see, is there one coming? Okay, there's one coming down. Okay. So, is there anyone who's not at the institute? Are you at the institute? Did you want notes? Uh, uh, I mean, I, I don't seem to have enough. That's my difficulty. And I can easily. Give notes. Uh, I'll give you one. I, I'll give you one tomorrow. Is there anyone else who needs one? Huh? Okay. Okay. I'll send her one. I have to make some more. All right. So, we just have time to get started. We get started on just remember that we do have to do. We are here. For mathematical purposes, let me start again. For those who have read all that that thick set of notes, there's not, uh, this will be dull. But in case you haven't read the thick set of notes and haven't found all the errors, there are a lot of errors I discover. Some of them obvious, some of them less obvious. And uh, uh, they may cause you trouble. So don't. If you, if you ever look at the notes and have some and, and, and find what seems to be error, I think you can safely assume that it is an error. So, <laughs> so let's start here. So we're starting with the prime number. We're going to do, uh, I'm going to see if I can't do in the time that remains, one thing that's, that's important and preparatory for next week. I may not finish. So we, we have a prime number p, and I just want to introduce a notation. These equal sign with three bars means that the difference between a and b is divisible by the prime p. And if we put this in, if we, we don't know what the prime is, if we have some prime that's clear to us, we just write this. And I just reminded this is a basic notion of number theory. So if a and b are not equal to 0, this was, remember, from Euclid. This is a proposition from Euclid, which is really important here, that if a and b are not divisible by p, so if they're not equivalent to 0 modulo p. So if a is not equivalent to 0 and b is not equivalent to 0, then a, b is not equivalent to 0. Now that means if we had a relation like this, a, b equivalent to a, c, which means a, b minus a, c is divisible by p. So we could write it this way, which means that a times b minus c is equivalent to 0. So this uh, should have been just three lines there. But if a times, so this relation implies this, but if a is not divisible by 0, if a, is, if a is not divisible by p, rather, then because of this proposition 7.30, then b minus c is divisible by 0, which means by p, which means that b minus c is equivalent to 0, or we could write it, or b is equivalent to c. So this, from the fact that a, b is equivalent to a, c, Provided that p does not divide a, we can deduce on the basis of Euclid's proposition 7 to 30 that b is equivalent from c. All right, so that's an important point one. Now, let me just start going. So suppose I start from some a, which is not equivalent to 0 mod p. I form, I square it, I cube it, I take the fourth power, and so on. And I only look at the, re the remainder of these numbers when I divide by p. None of them will be divisible by p. So there are 
only, I mean, the remainder is a number between 1 and p minus 1. So eventually, I find two remainders that are the same. So eventually, I find two powers, a m and a n, such that a m and a n, such that their difference is divisible by p. Or if I write this another way, a m, a n is after all a m times a n minus m. So this a m minus a n is just that. It's equivalent to 0 because these two are equivalent. But this is not, so I can cancel it. And, and that's an error, right? This is a, that's a, an obvious one is equivalent to one. So a n minus to a to the n minus m minus one is equivalent to zero. So eventually there's some power which is one, which leaves the remainder one. So some power of a leaves the remainder one when divisible by when divided by p. So that's what this says. All right. And what is it in red here? Here, yeah. what I what I. I've written that A itself is not divisible by P. So A is not equivalent to 0. OK. I, I forgot to put it in in the text. Right? OK. So, so there's always some integer such that A to that integer leaves the remainder 1. And therefore, there's the smallest one, R, the smallest possible, in, possible integer that depends on a, and it's that a to the r is equal to 1. And then if a to the s is equivalent to 1, and s is greater than r, then by a certain form of the Euclidean algorithm, or by the beginning parts of the Euclidean algorithm, we can write s as m times r plus n, where the remainder n is, not, is less than r. And then we'd have a to the s, that's equivalent to 1. That's equivalent to a r m times a n. But this a to the r leaves the remainder 1 when we divide, so we can simply suppress it, and we get 1 is equal to a to the n. But r was the smallest possible, and n is less than r, so n has to be 0. N was In other words, if we choose r as small as possible, then any a to, whenever a to the s is equivalent to 1, then s is a multiple of r. And so this number, in so far as a is concerned, is called the order of a, modulo p. Now, now we want to study some things very briefly, but nonetheless a little more generally than we did when we discussed Gauss periods. Gauss periods, we took p equals 17. And we examined two choices of a, 2 and 3. And what we looked for, we, we we looked for without we look for some number whose order is 16. Now p minus 1 is 17 minus 1 is 16. So the order is 16, it divides 16. The order of 8, which is also divides 16. So those were two. That's an example of this particular fact here that every associate any integer a and any prime p, there's this order. Now what I wanted to observe here is that if we take any power of a, so with order r, then we can always find a t such that s plus t is divisible by r. That's clear. When we find any number, we can add something to it, which is a multiple of r. And that means that s plus t is a multiple of r. So this is a to the rm, but a to the r leaves the remainder 1. And then if we take 1 to some power, it still leaves the remainder 1. So we have a to the s plus t leaves remainder 1. It means a to the s times a to the t leaves the remainder 1. In other words, in a certain sense, whenever we have a to the s, and in particular whenever we have a itself, we can always find some other number. So that when they multiply together, they leave the remainder 1. I have a number whose remainder is 1. So I just repeat this example that you can look at. Here are the powers of 2 to the n from 1 to 16. And I can take them. I look at the remainder. You can see what the remainder is. And you, these are the remainders. So what you see is that r is 8. Namely, this sequence starts to repeat itself after 8 times. 
whereas for 3, the powers of 3 up to 16, these are the three to the powers, the powers of 3. If I take the modulo 17, then they're all different. And the first power of 3, which is 1, is 3 to the 16th. And we, we used that. We, used, we needed the fact that there were 16 different powers, different that 3, that all the powers 3 to the n gave 16 different remainders when divided by, when we divided by 3. I mean, when we divided by 17. All right, this is about as far as we can get today. What we want to do, I just point out to you, what we, th this is not what we ultimately want to do, but the first application we will make of this is the following fact. And uh, then we'll go on to something else. We'll go on to Coomer's later, Coomer's own work. We're going to make the following application next time, that if I have a prime p, which leaves the remainder 1 when it's divisible by 3. And odd, so this p would necessarily be odd. Now and then again, leave the remainder 1 when it's divisible by 6 even. Then I can find two integers, k and l, such that k squared minus kl plus l squared is equal to p. So this is the application we're going to make of this kind of consideration. And what I want to point out this time, so you can mull on it just a little bit between now and the last lecture, is that this is hard to prove. Think of trying to prove it. Think of just saying that for any number p, which at least the remainder 1, which is congruent to when, when, when div divided by 3, I can find two other integers, k and l, which satisfies this equation. This is a very hard fact to show, and, and, and we'll show it. So it, it will seem, when we do it, as though it's just something which is inessential, but it, uh, it's a hard thing to show. Anyhow. We will, we will do that next time, just not for its own sake so much, but as an introduction to some of the ideas of Coomer on, uh, on Fermat that, that I want to discuss. And in particular, I'll come to this question as to why the proof that worked, for, uh, the proof that worked, that showed that Coomer, that Fermat's theorem was true for n equals 3, does not work for n equals 2. All right, well, thank you very much.